Hello, and welcome to Lesson 15 of A Course for the Writer Mom, Reawaken the Dream of Writing. A course for writer moms or anyone who has to write in little fragments of time because you can't put together a long session of writing where you learn the tools that will let you be able to write consistently, coherently across those fragments of time. And we are building on our 10th character trait. So we're really starting to chug through the character traits now, uh, building our power of living characters. So since this is lesson 15, if this is your first time tuning in, you might want to start back with one. There's a lot of great material here. So as we move forward, let's begin with a very brief review of what we covered in the last lesson. The last lesson we talked about perseverance and we were saying that perseverance was getting over obstacles in our path and we compared that to constancy which is putting one foot after the other in a seemingly endless road. We said that the struggle was like the migrating animal reaching a river. Constancy was like crossing the long, the wide dry plain but perseverance was crossing the river and so the major motion was a feeling of dread um, and it wasn't so much eek but as dread so the struggle was getting past the obstacle the lost state was giving up and we had to break that down into the reasons why you might give up and the victory state was pushing through and getting over that hurdle and the exciting thing there was that you actually get to do a milestone celebration. We said perseverance was a part of the resili resiliency group, and that means standing firm. firm. All of the traits in the resilience group involve standing firm. So now what we're ready for today is another trait in the empathy group. Courtesy. And as always, we begin with our scenarios. Sally was still stinging from the stare down that she'd been given by her boss, Marlena. Her crime? She said, good morning. Sally couldn't get used to the idea of saying nothing when her boss came through, but she hadn't yet discovered the formula that was going to make her boss happy. So she was churning around a little bit on that when all of a sudden she was startled to discover that her boss was standing right next to her. She hadn't heard the office door and the footsteps were all muffled by the carpet. Sally, you suppose you could break out of that daydream for long enough to get me a cup of coffee? Put it on my desk. I'll be right back. And she took off down the hall. Courtesy. Rudy was talking to Anna. Oh, Marlena is going to chew Sally up and spit her out. Nobody lasts long in that job, and Sally isn't going to make it. Then he stopped cold because he noticed Marlena coming down the hall. He dropped everything and made a few steps down the hall to greet her. How is the lovely Marlena this morning? Come right this way. Dick will be back in a moment. Shall I seat you in his office? Can I get you a cup of coffee? I know just how you like it. Hot and bold, just like you. Courtesy. Richard was headed back to his office, thinking about what he was going to say to Marlena. Oh, it was so much fun. The ice woman Ah, how sweet she had turned when she learned about the promotion that was in the wind. Well, she had the job. There wasn't really anybody better. But, oh, he was having so much fun toying with her. Courtesy. Sally's lunchtime had arrived, and Marlene wasn't back in the office yet. She didn't know whether she should leave for lunch or not. She always told Marlena when she was leaving the building she was fretting and really didn't know what to do. 
she looked through the open office door. Well, there was that cup of coffee from this morning. Marlene had never been back to even drink a drop. Fifteen minutes went by and Sally realized that, oh, she didn't go now. She'd never get back in time for lunch and it wouldn't do to be late. So she scurried down the hall and approached the bank of elevators. She was hoping one would come soon because it can sometimes be a long wait. But luckily, she heard the bing and the down arrow just as she walked up. She got on board and then she noticed coming down the hall was Anna carrying a, a teetering stack of files. She held the door, the elevator door for her, waited for her. Anna to get on the elevator and then asked her what floor, punched it for her, held the door again when Anna got out. So it was quite some time before she finally got out of the elevator and onto the street. She scurried down the sidewalk towards her favorite bagel shop. Even on her budget, she could get a bagel sandwich and it was enough to fill her up. Uh-oh, the line was out the door. Hopefully she stood in line, but before long she realized that line was not moving fast enough. So she gave up and went back to the office. On her way back, she thought to herself, well, at least I won't be late getting back. Courtesy. Courtesy, the analysis. The struggle of courtesy is a very interesting one. It's the struggle of the alpha animal in a pack of animals, keeping all the other animals in line and being able to eat his share of the food before anyone else got to scramble to get whatever was left. It also fits the idea of a pecking order, like in chickens. The idea you see of the struggle of courtesy is the struggle to give the other person the civility that that person is due just on account of there being another human being without regard to any form of status or honors. The struggle of courtesy is a strange one because if you're in the struggle, that implies you're at the rudder level and courtesy is kind of like loyalty. If you're at the rudder level, your character is already in trouble. For a civil society, courtesy should be at least an anchor trait, if not a base trait. So then, what are the lost states of courtesy? Well, the obvious one is just plain rudeness. When a person or a character is rude to another person or character, the message is very clear. You don't matter. I do not need to give you any respect. I hold you in contempt. And it's a strange one too, because normally a person thinks that their thoughts are private to their mind. But the person who behaves in this rude manner is showing all the world what's going on in the head. But that's not the only lost state of courtesy. Another lost state of courtesy is a fancy word, obsequiousness. Overdoing courtesy. And this comes in two forms. In one form, the person regards the other with total contempt. The character or the person has no regard for the other person, but they're not in a position to be able to be rude. And so they're sweetsy, sweetsy, courteous as a way of <laughs> hidden rudeness. But there's another form of it, and that's the fawning. You want something, you're hoping to get something, your character has something that they want to get from the other person. So the over-exaggerated courtesy is to play up to the other person to get something out of them. But there's yet one more lost state of courtesy. And this one 
is a ringer. Neediness. Neediness? What does neediness have to do with courtesy? Well, neediness is actually a form of a dominance behavior. Neediness, as we mean it here, is when one person exposes their vulnerabilities to the other under a hidden demand that, they're, that they be fed in some way. So the, what makes it a dominance behavior is that there is a concealed contract which the other party did not get a choice of entering into. The, the individual is saying, on, on account of my vulnerabilities that I've just exposed, you are on the hook to feed me. So that's what we're talking about with this kind of neediness. Now, I'm not talking about when you get home from work and you've had a bad day or the kids have been awful all day and honey gets home and you say, oh, I've had a horrible day, honey. Can I have a hug? I need a hug. That's not what we're talking about here. That's just straight up asking for what you need from a person that you have a reasonable expectation that you will get your needs met. No, with neediness, we're talking about one person essentially playing the other. Uh, and so that is the element that throws it into the lost state and why it, it is a lost state of courtesy because you know that character really isn't being courteous to the character that it's trying to play. Because when you're trying to play another person, that's kind of the opposite of being courteous towards them. So what is the victory state of courtesy? We already spoke of the fact that courtesy, if all goes well in a normal civil society, it should at least be an anchor trait, preferably a base trait. And if it's an anchor trait or a base trait, that means that there is no struggle going on. And if there's no struggle, there's no overt victory. So the victory state of courtesy is no drama at all. Isn't that a funny one? So now we have to talk about modifiers. The modifiers of the whole empathy group, so we're going to do our empathy group along with our modifiers, all of the modifiers for all of the character traits in the empathy group involve interactions, one character with another, one human being with another. And therefore, they're always visible. They're always in plain sight. And that is a very interesting feature for us as authors because all we need to do is write the interaction and what's going on in the minds of the other people falls out onto the falls out between the lines for our reader to understand without us having to spell it out. So what are the modifiers of the empathy group? Like all of the character traits, scale is it's the main modifier. But rather, what's rather interesting in the empathy group, with scale, what's at, scale is all about what is at stake and with the empathy group, what is at stake is the relationship itself. And that's why it's rather interesting dynamic that goes on. Remember with loyalty, uh, which is also in the empathy uh, group, and if you were disloyal to someone super close to you, that was the highest possible stake. And yet we've got something funny going on with courtesy because sometimes people are the most discourteous to the people that they are closest to. And sometimes it even becomes this habitual thing where it doesn't even mean that they don't love each other. It's just they've fallen into a habit 
of being discourteous to one another. So the scale, the scale plays in a funny way. But without courtesy or without these empathy traits in general, that since they're all about relationships, if we have a character who is weak in these empathy traits, assuming they're not an out and out villain, what you're going to have is somebody who has difficulty forming relationships and loneliness might creep in. So that might be an interesting theme for a story based around the empathy traits in general and courtesy in particular. So on to the second part of our lesson where we're going to be talking about the character profile tool. The character profile tool, our next two lessons are very, very interesting ways that you can motivate your story and help build the emotional level in the story. We're going to be talking about hooks next week and presaging this week. Uh, just the tiniest bit on hooks. Every rudder trait has with it, within it an implicit hook. And that is a mechanism by which an astute villain can rope a character in by their rudder traits, by spotting these hooks. But we won't go into that this week. That's for next week. This week, we're going to talk about presaging. We've talked about something just as a background, normal state of things. Throughout these lessons, we have said many, many times that if you have a character who has a trade in the rudder position, you can show early in your story that that trade is in the rudder position. And then later on, at the, when the drama is higher and the scale is more elevated, your reader will, will be on edge because they know that trade is, is up for grabs in the rudder position. And so they will automatically be nervous for whether or not the character will make the right choice. And that is a form of signaling. But what we're going to explore today is a more subtle type of signaling. It's a subset of signaling. Presaging is signaling with an implicit warning. It's setting up a danger signal. And what we're going to cover today is how a technique for setting that warning signal possibly at a subconscious level in your reader. All of these empathy traits have the fact in common that as humans, we are very, very adept at picking up clues. Humans are social animals. We're tribal creatures. We're village creatures. And we are very, very good at picking up clues when things are off in the empathy group. And we just store it away in an interesting manner. Let me give you an example. What we're going to cover here is the concept of a mixed signal. And a mixed signal is when the words and the observ observed behavior do not line up. Let me give you a simple example. Joan is standing in the buffet line and someone brings in great big tray of donuts and someone says oh oh june you want one of the, here's a donut you want to have a donut and she says no i don't eat donuts but then she spends an inordinate amount of time staring at that tray of donuts a co-worker if they catch on to it consciously might say to themselves oh yeah i know what she means I don't eat donuts in public. Ha, ha, ha. I've got her figured out. But it's more likely that it would just be registered in the back of one's mind that, huh, huh, something is off. But then if Joan goes on to say, my grandmother had a tray just like that when I was a little girl. I, I wonder whatever became of it. Mystery solved. It's not a disconnect. It's not a mixed signal. And the subconscious mind, the less verbal part of the mind, just lets go of the tension. Just drops it. Oh, okay. 
There's no disconnect. But when the disconnect exists, a tension arises. And that tension is so powerful because readers read novels in large measure because of the enjoyment that that tension creates and the anticipation of what's going to resolve the tension. So let's take a more serious case of a mixed signal. A man is standing in a, at an evening attire at a formal gathering, standing around a husband and his wife, and he takes the hand of the wife and says, my, what lovely hands you have. But his eyes are taking in her gemstone bracelet, kind of mentally weighing the carrot weight of the gemstones. Mix signal, lovely hands. Why was he focused on her bracelet? So that gets registered in the less verbal part of the brain of the reader. You can let it go cold and you can go on and show this person as seemingly on the up and up. You know, he goes on to say in his conversation, he clasps her husband on the shoulder and says, I am going to make this rich husband of yours even richer. And we're wondering, uh uh, what's going on? But chapter two could go by, and our guy might seem on the up and up. The investment might not seem like a bad idea, but come around to the key point where the gentleman is about to sign his fortune away. All you need to do is bring that bracelet back into the story. And the readers will be practically screaming at the pages of the book, don't sign, don't sign. Because it connects. It's been presaged and now it connects. We know he's a crook. We know he's not up to any good. It's a very, very, very powerful tool. And um, along with the general signaling that you'll want to do. In terms of signaling, we might want to make another point, And that's that. If you're writing a chapter book for a youth and you want to put the virtue on display, your rudder trait like we talked about earlier, you're probably going to have to do it rather blatantly to make sure that the youth picks up on the fact that, that this one isn't down pat on the part of our character. Whereas, of course, with an, uh, a book written for grown-ups, you can be as subtle as you can manage it to be. And the more subtle you can manage it and still convey it, the more exciting your, your story will be. So that is our character profile tool for today. Now you might have noticed that our empathy group is really starting to grow. And keep up with your uh, reference sheets. They are going to be so, so handy for you as you develop your characters. I was just using mine this morning to work on a character in the novel that I'm writing. And I was thrilled to find out that six of her character traits we already had covered. And um, that's pretty exciting because 10 character traits you're already past the third of the way point in the total character traits. So you're getting to have a pretty good library of traits now. Um, so don't forget to keep up with your reference sheets. So that is our lesson for today. Next week, we'll talk about another character trait. And we will talk about hooks and see how you can use those in the creation of your story. I am Kathleen Spracklin, caregiver to the writer mom. Have a great week. See you next week. Bye-bye.